So uh, today is the 29 September 2020, and it's my pleasure to welcome Martin Olivia from Canada. Uh, Martin is working on host pathogen interaction and their impact on innate inflammatory and microbicidal function for over 30 years. Uh, his work has permitted to demonstrate how various protozoan parasites can modify host signaling pathways in their favor, including the impact of EVs in this context. So today uh, he's going to give us a, a lecture on Lysmania parasite, EVs and viruses, a dangerous trio. So please welcome Martin. So uh, first, thank you, Carolina and uh, Dolores. I mean, it's very, uh, I mean, it's a strange medium. It's my second time only I give a conference like this, so it's kind of weird, but anyway, it's a nice way to uh, see friends. I mean, we don't see it too often these days, so, uh, and, uh, so I will try to give you a, a nice presentation because, I mean, it's also different ways to present. We are not the same feeling. It's not a face-to-face, -face, I mean, it's a face-to-face -face contact, but not there at the moment, so it's a, maybe a, will be more crazy or <laughs> I don't know but still okay so today as I can I mentioned I mean I will uh, show you some old and some new stuff uh, but um, I mean I will try to show you an, an interesting presentation in the context of more infectious diseases uh, oh, oh, can I? Oh, what I have to click it there. so I mean uh, what is the Shemina it's a present I work for I mean uh, since 1984 in fact I did my PhD on Leishmania, so it's more than 30 years ago. So the thing is, uh, but this is a, uh, this parasite is transmitted by the bite of a sand fly that you see here. And uh, during the blonde meal, it, the promastigot parasite will enter the cells and then will interact with macrophage and neutrophils. And neutrophils infected can also be phagocytosed by macrophage and using a Trojan uh, strategy to enter the cells. So, uh, Thereafter, parasite transform to emastigot, as you see inside, divide under that form, and then they break the cells, infect other naive cells, or at some point they get, I mean, uh, ingested by naive sand fly, and under inside they will develop uh, different, I will just shut this down, sorry. But and, uh, the thing they will, I mean, then uh, get that intra uh, gut de the development in the, the host, the insect host, and, and on the promastic gut form, etc. Anyway, I don't want to take too much time to explain this, but it's important if people don't know much about Leishmania. Uh, so what I've been very much interested is really the initial interaction, because it's a go-no-go. -go. If the parasite is able to infect, it will proceed, and then it will get a nice infection. But if it is, is blocked, because microbiome function are turned on, and then they are killed, it's not gonna work. So they develop very, uh, I mean, uh, elegant way to do so. But first, I mean, what is Lashmania as well? Pathogenesis. I mean, then you have different form. You have the cutaneous Lashmaniasis, which is only at the site of the bite. Then you have mucocutaneous Lashmaniasis. That this one is only for, found in uh, South America. And it starts as a lesion that will disappear after a few months, but then many years later, two months later, it will reappear in the nasopharyngeal area. And then you have the deadly one, the Vichyr Lashmaniasis, that killed 50 to 100,000 people per year in uh, India, I mean, uh, Northeast, uh, uh, Northeast Africa, like Ethiopia, or they uh, saw some in South America. But uh, the main problem is really outside this deadly disease is the one, the form that are causing more disfiguration and things like that on uh, affecting millions of people in tropical, subtropical area of the world. And here, so you have a little dog that has uh, visual shmaniasis that instead to be in the liver and the spleen and bone marrow as in human, in the dog, they have also, uh, I mean, cutaneous uh, form of the disease. So leishmania parasite, the promised gut, which live in the gut of the sand fly. I mean, I have different type of urine factor. I mean, uh, like cysteine propeptidase, they have lipophosphate lichen, but the one I will go fast is the GP63. It's a zimmetalloprotease that we have been studying for many, many years. And uh, we found that, in fact, this was a, it's a key virulence factor by Leishmania. In fact, I mean, it's here, it's uh, covering uh, over 20 years of work. I mean, with uh, very, I mean, uh, talented young PhD and postdoc that was in the lab. And in fact, what we found is that GP63, 
I mean, once it's released by the parasite or in contact, I mean, it can I mean, inactivate several signaling pathways. So the JAK-STAT, I mean, the MAP kinases and the, as well the IRAC, and in some species, they will affect the, uh, also the, uh, it's not written there, but they will affect the inflammasome. And one of the key things that is happening is that it's able to activate tyrosine phosphase, such as SHP1, that is a negative regulators of these uh, different signaling pathways. And downstream, this will, I mean, kind of block the cells or avoid induction of microbacillus functions such as a nitric oxide and others that usually will kill parasite and also will re render the cells uh, not capable to, end, to uh, react to interferon gamma or LPS that usually will induce function of their cells. And one thing also we know is that also the uh, parasite can also alter like uh, the host protein translation pathways by affecting the mTOR pathway. This is, has been uh, uh, done by the work of uh, Maritza Ramiro as a postdoc in under the lab, but she was working with me with malaria. And I'm talking more about her because she's there, I saw her. <laughs> so nevertheless, so one thing is the GP3 was very interesting. And then the work from uh, here, Adelaida Gomez, I mean, who's, who's from Colombia, and now she's back there. When we observed in 2006, that's how we become interested to see vesicles because when she was looking at GP63 in the infected cells, if you have promastigot and you see how the green there is a GP63, when we did a close up, we found out there we saw those kind of little bubbles there and it were, they were too big to be, uh, I mean, it could be a tosome coming from somewhere from the parasite, but we didn't know what it was. But then we ask ourselves, is this uh, those famous vesicles that start to be described in the 2000? And uh, then we found out also that some people did work with Trypanosoma cruzi already, I mean, showing that they are produced by uh, uh, protozoan parasites such as Leishmania. So uh, then from there, we uh, decided to study them further. So here, I mean, to go rapidly, this is the resume of uh, three different papers that have been our first paper being by our, my PhD student, uh, Kasra Asani. Uh, so what we found in fact is that, uh, I mean, these vesicles, I mean, in Leishmania can be rapidly produced when we uh, mimic when the parasites coming from uh, the whole, the, the insect vector to the host at 37. And this, uh, within four hours, we have production of vesicles of different type. I mean, and some looks like the right size as an uh, exosome of Leishmania or ectosome, anything like that. And in fact, uh, we've been able to isolate with the, I will not tell about the procedure because we all know how to proceed from cell culture, filtration, ultrasonification, nanocyte, et cetera. So we did all these things. And then what we found in fact, and uh, at the same time as well, uh, Neil Reiner used to be my postdoc supervisor. I mean, <laughs> we, we showed the, uh, the same thing that in fact, the Leishmania variance factor are highly enriched in those vesicles. I mean, so we found a lot of GP63 and then there's factor one alpha and even the LPG, sometimes we can see it by proteomic, but the, by Western it's detectable. What we found is that as the parasites do, they were able to modulate the cell signaling of the host cells, as well as to inactivate function of those phagocytes as much as the parasite itself is doing the job. And when we use them in the uh, in the uh, vivo to inoculate them in the in the uh, in the animals, we saw that there was also pro-inflammatory. So they were able to recruit inflammatory inflammatory uh, sorry inflammatory cells. And as the Leishmania do so, I mean, they were mimicking what the 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 mother cells was doing. So they were and that was very interesting. So but from there, I mean, this has been the all, all done in culture. So we ask ourselves, this is an artifact because you can culture all kinds of cells, macrophage, cancer cells, something like that, and they will produce those vesicles while they are growing as the parasite when they grow. But we then decide to look what's happening inside the sand fly. And these are very tiny little guys. Eh? So I mean, the thing then in collaboration with uh, Shadon Kamawi, who's not in the photo, here's the postdoc who did the work, Vanessa Ataid. Uh, Shadon Kamawi at the NIH sent us a uh, gut from a sand fly named Ludzomia, okay, that uh, not open and also that have been uh, lavage and they did thousands of infected non-infected uh, sand fly i mean for infected with leishmania major who cause cutaneous leishmaniasis and the uh, leishmania infantum who cause visceral leishmaniasis so uh, with the one with the with the with the lavage we, we were getting around 150 microliter to work with several times but then from there we used uh, more the exoquick type things because we cannot use the other ways at that time to isolate that from that small volume. And also with the electron microscopy from cut through the gut of the same fly to observe uh, if there was, I mean, or not 
vesicles there released by the parasite. So what we found, in fact, here, to do go rapidly, uh, this is just uh, the most enriched uh, protein that we observe uh, from vesicles isolated from the uh, uh, infected uh, same fly. As you can see, we have a uh, to Berlin, we have uh, an engagement factor one alpha. We have HSP70, HSP83, somewhere else. So, I mean, several of the key uh, biomarkers, if you can see, or molecule enriched in vesicle were there. And of interest, we have our famous uh, Leishmaniolysin or GP63 was highly enriched in our parasite. So, this was uh, very uh, exciting. So, it was clear then that, yes, in a real context, real infectious in vivo context, the parasite inside its vector is able to release vesicles. This was the first report of any vector being able to release, I mean, vesicles in their uh, environment. After that, there has been people with tick and other, uh, I mean, vector that showed that was happening there too. Here it's electron microscopy uh, being performed, I mean, uh, through the gut of the sand fly, as you can see, and hey, here, here we have a nice vesicle uh, going out and seems to be more ectosome type because we don't see uh, several at the same time. So uh, there was uh, this type. We saw many vesicles uh, released through the flagellar pocket, like that of the, of the parasite there, and then going outside, as you can see here. But of interest, we observed also multivesicular body-like structure inside the parasite that was containing vesicles. And here you have one that I must have fused and then release several uh, vesicles that they're on the right size for it to be exosome. And uh, that was a very, were very exciting because we were able to show that in a real in vivo context, there was production and release of those vesicles by the parasite in the vector. In fact, where we look at, it's around this part. That's the, the back of the mid, in the mid gut. But of interest, uh, we decided to look at the near where the parasite, the metacyclic form, the parasite accumulate because they are the most infectious ones. They are the ones that are transmitted to the, the animals by the bite of the, the blood the meal of the, the, uh, the sand fly. And here is some electron microscopy showing that yeah, effectively even the metacyclic that we have here are releasing vesicles, I mean, in that area. So it was there. And uh, at that time we observed this thing, just an anecdote, that we saw this thing that looked like a nanotubes. But when we did those experiments, the nanotube hasn't been observed yet. So we just saw it was a nice cute thing. So where we can see vesicles inside. Uh, so, but the ultimate thing is what, is it transmitted? We know that the same fly when they bite, they will transmit the parasite on the other side. But then we did some experiment using, I mean, the chicken membrane through which the same fly can bite. And then on the other side was collected parasite and whatever has been uh, vomit, if I can say, on the other side. And effectively we've been able to uh, collect under and attach, in, in fact, to the membrane because it was it with sticky, uh, some uh, phospholycan type things that the parasite, uh, the parasite, the vector can have also in the mouth. So here you have a, a from infantum and major in a column that were I mean isolated on the other side, and they were also uh, found to be by Western to contain GP63. So they were with that. So from there we put ourselves in the context of infection. So what's happening if we co-inoculate, as we saw that it was not only parasites are, are inoculated. What's happening if the exosome plus the parasite are inoculated? So it's difficult to have, uh, I mean, uh, at that time, a knockout for the, for, the, for the S curve pathway. So, but when we did for that paper, we used stationary phase or metacyclic purified parasite to which we add or not exosome to be inoculated at the same time. And as you can see here, that's some photo. Uh, uh, we see that uh, when it's uh, inoculated only with the parasite, we have an ice infection. But in each case, whether for the, the metacyclic or for the stationary phase, uh, less purified parasite, there's a very strong increase and significant increase of the foot pad swelling in uh, the context when exosomes are co inoculated with the parasite. As you can see here, it's uh, that, I mean, the animal facility people, I mean, tap on our hand because it was crazy. We didn't know it was uh, so much reactive, but there was a, very, was a huge increase of the skin pathology. That's the, uh, due to the exosome. We did many other experiments to prove that, like, uh, I mean, destroying the vesicles to show that when they are not uh, uh, proper, they cannot do the job. Uh, here, it's only a graph showing that we use different dose, 0.1 microgram, one microgram, 10 microgram. We showed that, that dose of one microgram, which correspond around to a uh, proportion to what will be in the, in the sand fly. We see there's a nice increase of the skin inflammation observe, I mean, in the mice receiving that in their foot pad. And also this, not in inflammation, but also there was a greater number 
of parasites that can be uh, collected uh, and um, evaluated by PCR. I mean, in the, the one receiving the uh, one temac randomly compared to the one only with the parasite. One of our most interest here, was what we did, we were interested to look a bit at the immune response. So what we did, we take the no lymph node at five weeks, if I remember, of the one microgram inoculated versus the, the only stationary phase. <laughs> and as you can see, interestingly, in orange, I mean, in, in all cases, when we did the PCR, a QRT PCR, we observed that many of the cytokine, pro-inflammatory cytokine that are known to be turned on during a Leishmania infection were highly exacerbated in that context of a co-inoculation. And this also, for instance, interestingly, for the IL-17 and the IL-23, which is known to be, uh, to be sometime, I mean, if uh, involved in uh, skin pathology. But this, you have to remember, that was in Bob C. mice. Bob C. mice in Leishmania, they go toward a TH2 type, actually, which will cause lesion that cannot uh, 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 heal. And in that case, it seems to, uh, I mean, also, in addition to have IL-4 and IL-10, I mean, to uh, crank up uh, the, the gene expression related to IL-17, IL-23, so the TH17 immune response. In fact, from that uh, study, I mean, we have been able to demonstrate that in a vector, I mean, like in this case, the sandfly vector, I mean, the uh, parasites that are growing in the gut were able to release vesicle that are co-inoculated together during the blood meal and doing an, an artificial manner show that the co-inoculation of vesicle with the parasite was concurrent to increase not only the lesion, parasitic load, but also to favor I-17 type response. So showing that these vesicles have a role to play, in fact, in the pathology that we observe, I mean, in the, during a, a Leishmania infection. So that was uh, very exciting. But the thing that this is now is I'm jumping into some new stuff, but how Leishmania exosome conquer to augment that stick? What is the interaction? Why compared to promacigot? What in fact exosome do the job? Because what we have to realize, I mean, is that if we inoculate exosome alone, which are not infectious, they cause nothing. I mean, there's no infection for sure. There are no inflammation. That's fine. But the thing is that when you put them together, there's something happening at the beginning that favored that uh, per inflammation and development of a stronger skin pathology. So we did different screen of uh, protein or uh, uh, I mean knockout animals for that could detect protein or some that uh, interest find in the Leishmania and the exosome and also the one that are related to the RNA content so the TLR3, TLR9, thing like that. But we didn't see anything uh, right and when we then uh, also think about the lipids that form the the uh, vesicles, then we uh, thought that maybe that can be a good way to look at. But first, we also thought that the, what Leishmania infectious mechanisms involve. We know that they are infecting neutrophils and macrophage. In fact, in what they are doing, in fact, during infection, they will infect neutrophils, they will become apoptotic, and then they will be engulfed by macrophage, and then the Trojan horse tactic. And you see here a nice uh, neutrophils that is, uh, I mean, engulfed by the macrophage, as you can see here. Also, what Leishmania Exosome are, they are virus size, that's normal. All vesicles are virus size. They are lipid bilayer, bilayer and uh, so they can modulate phagocyte function and phosphatidyl serine is abundant in Leishmania membrane. So having those information in hand and then having tested different uh, protein or uh, nucleic acid related things that can be found in the, in the, in the vesicles of Leishmania, then we uh, decide to look, I mean, we know that, uh, I mean, apoptotic body, which are source type of vesicles can be recognized by, I mean, the, uh, by the annexin family member they will interact with. And so what we did, we, uh, we look at the literature, we look who might, I mean, be involved in that type of thing. And then we found that annexin A1 could be a very interesting candidate because it's involved in fact, in uh, the, uh, the fact that the, during, uh, uh, I mean, to control inflammation that, I mean, they are going to be produced by macrophage and they are so neutrophil, but then neutrophils that will help the neutrophils to become apoptotic, they will release that, and then that will be recognized by macrophage that will capture the neutrophil. So that was fitting a bit by our, our things. And also, uh, interestingly, it has been reported that uh, it was involved in mycobacterium infection of macrophage, which is also... I mean, I mean, an intracellular parasite as the Schmania. And uh, whereas they didn't look in the same context, it was also indicating something going well. And also an one has been found to be uh, very important and participate for the, uh, in fact, uh, 
the something receptor antagonization, such as the GF receptor. And also has been shown that, I mean, they can help, I mean, virus such as influenza. I mean, that to better infect cells. So having this in hand, then we decide to, okay, let's try uh, an uh, in vivo model in the annexin A1 knockout. And uh, then that's why we proposed that this molecule, sorry, I just did that part today. <laughs> uh, so uh, we proposed that annexin A1 could be a molecule involved in that interaction, okay, to cause that uh, exacerbation and infection, uh, greater infection and exacerbation. So what we did, we used B6 mice and ANXA1 knockout. And those have been, as the other one, have been injected, not only in the foot pad with Leishmania with and without exosome. And then we follow the infection. And here I pinpoint this B6 mice, because I mentioned earlier, it's not gonna be the same type of uh, inflammation. There's inflammation, but the thing is that in B6 mice, is the TH1 type response. So at some point, uh, like 10 to 15 weeks after the initial infection, there's a control over the, uh, the there's a, Kick, the adaptive immune response kick in, and then there's a control over the infection. So here's the data that I mean, we obtained, I mean, N equals 15 mice in each uh, group. And uh, we repeat that, I mean, five mice at a time, but three times separate time. And as you can see here clearly is that, okay, we have the wild type L major, as you can see here in the black dot here, is giving, I mean, the typical infection of uh, during uh, L major in the B6 mice. This is not the same level and it's going down by 10, 15 weeks. I mean, it was clear that uh, if you infect in the, uh, in the knockout animals, that was the, uh, the, the dotted line, but the, with the, the black circle, you can see that they are following the same pattern. So there's no, l major by itself doesn't change much the infection. But of interest, we know that as for biopsy mice, when we inoculate exosome plus Leishmania, you have clearly an increase of the foot pad swelling compared to the wild type alone. So they were clearly working as well in the B6 mice. But of our most interest, what we actually were very excited is that when we have no annexin A1 in the system, you can see that in the, the, the black square, but with the dotted line, there was, I mean, no exacerbation of the foot pad swelling as observed with the exosome plus Leishmania. So then telling us that clearly, I mean, annexin A1 has something to, to do in the, that, I mean, exacerbation of the infection when we co-inoculate exome plus Leishmania. So from there we ask ourselves, I mean, does, uh, but what about the immune response? At which level it's happening? So uh, to do so, then we, uh, we took, I mean, uh, the uh, lymph nodes of, uh, in the pop little lymph node of the foot pad infected and also non-infected as control. And we look after one, five and 10 weeks. And uh, here you have the typical uh, data we obtain in uh, response to the wild type in the, in the B6 mice. Okay, the TH1 is turned on. You can see that by five weeks, I mean, there's a very nice response kicking in that will release uh, going down by 10 weeks. Okay, in that, that time, the parasites start to be controlled in the macrophage, I mean, by the, uh, of, uh, in the animals. Whereas TH17, we saw nothing. In the B6, whereas TH17 seems to be cranked up in the Bobsy mice, which has been reported for other type of things. In the Bob's B6 mice, there was no such thing. And the TH2 was showing the typical uh, uh, IL-4 increase at uh, uh, five and 10 weeks, but the thing, the proportion, I mean, of, uh, of the interferon gamma positive was higher than IL-4. So as we know, this will favor more control. But if we look at the same cytokine and CD4, CD8 cells, I'm not thinking, yeah. So what we found, in fact, here, so we followed over, here it's only showing the first five weeks. And uh, we look at in the wild type, the, the wild type receiving, uh, uh, is that so? yeah, the one receiving wild type only and the wild type plus exosome. And then the Axa knockout, wild type alone. I mean, uh, just the parasite and then the Axa knockout plus the exosome. And uh, so what we can see here for IL-4, there was no change. It was very similar, I mean, to uh, what you report before, even by five, 10 weeks. Uh, for IL-17, again, there was nothing going on. And interestingly, I mean, uh, both uh, response uh, of interferon was very uh, nice, but in all groups. So even in the knockout one, the interferon gamma production was very normal by the CD4, CD8 cells, that by the, the T effector cells in that group. So what we conclude from there, it was, I mean, it seems that the adaptive immune response, the way it was responding is not responsible for that variation we see in the, uh, foot pad swelling that we see when you have exome plus uh, 
Elish mania, and when there's no uh, annexing one, nothing happens. So then we decide to look more early. So uh, in order to look at the early inflammatory response, I mean, in the food pad, it's very difficult to get cells that recruit there after six hours. So we use a intraperitoneal inoculation of uh, the mice with the L major, with and without vesicles. And, uh, and that's what the scheme that one of the students did. I mean, Vanessa, in fact, we did that one. And then, uh, so what we do after uh, inoculation, six hour, we collect the, uh, the lavage, the peroneal cavity lavage, and then they were subjected to different things. And uh, in fact, it was the work from, not sorry, it was the work from uh, Alonso Lirafilo in the lab, who, who is that his project. You see, I'm getting old, 30 years on Lashmania. I mean, uh, make you old, so I start to forget things. <laughs> so, after six hours, what we observe is the following. I mean, if we look in the wild type in gray, you can see that the L major compared to BS increase a very nice, uh, induce a very nice recruitment of inflammatory cells. And uh, when we have exosome, I mean, there was, I mean, uh, a significant uh, increase of the number of cells recruited there. I mean, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that, was compared, uh, that was significant as well from uh, the one receiving Leishmania alone versus Leishmania plus exosome. In the annexin one knockout, we see the same scheme of uh, inflammatory cell recruitment. Uh, however, here for some dot were too low. I mean, there was a uh, non significant for the, the Leishmania alone in the ANGSA, maybe suggesting that the absent ANGSA Leishmania need, in a way, ANGSA somehow to modulate things. But nevertheless, for the exosome plus Leishmania, I mean, there was in the annexin one knockout, there was no difference at all was increased. Okay, so I mean, uh, as a, this one, you saw that one. Okay, so I'll repeat rapidly. Annexin one doesn't seem to be involved in the, in the fact that it will not interfere with the recruitment of inflammatory cells in response to Leishmania and Leishmania exosome is very similar. So, I mean, the thing here, what we did, then we look at the what type of cytokine, like pro inflammatory cytokine and kind of re, uh, release, and uh, here's just some of them. But uh, as what we can see, if we take the, the IL-6 here, uh, it's clear that the, uh, in response to a wild type, in the wild type or the knockout mice, I mean, uh, very similar amount of, uh, in the response to, wild, to Leishmania, very similar amount of uh, cytokine was uh, produced. It was slightly more in the context of the Leishmania uh, plus the vesicles, as you can see on the bottom here, okay? So in some case, there was such things, but it was not, uh, uh, I mean, a constant uh, observation. And at the end, anyway, when you compare the wild type versus the knockout, they were behaving around the same. So there was not big discrepancy, significant discrepancy in order to explain why, I mean, that we have a different infection when we have example Leishmania. So, but uh, as we uh, uh, here, uh, uh, but what we observe then, uh, so in addition to look at the inflammatory cell, we look at how cells become infected in vivo in the peroneal cavity. So uh, we did some cytospin, and then we see that uh, uh, if we look at, uh, I mean, the infected cells overall, macrophage and neutrophils together, we see that the one receiving Leishmania intraperitoneally, I mean, there was. A, a nice percentage, around 35% or more of cells become infected, okay? And there was slight reduction of the, of the number in the knockout mice, but I mean, this, I don't see the dot in that case. I mean, it's an old graph, but there was not significant because there was overlapping. But clearly is that when you give exosome, there was a clear augmentation of number of infected cells in that context compared to the wild type alone. And that uh, in the knockout, this, difference was very strongly reduced. So, I mean, this was suggesting somehow that it seemed that the, the annexin one will more uh, favor, I mean, infection of the, the cells, neutrophils and macrophage by the, the, the Leishmania. And in fact, here, if we decorticate like neutrophils versus macrophage, we see in fact, the neutrophils seems to be the most, I mean, affected. Because as you can see here, in grid the wild type cells, uh, in the, I mean, the from peroneal cavity was showing greater infection of their neutrophils. I mean, when there was uh, exosome co-inoculated, but I mean, in the knockout, I mean, you can see there was a clear reduction in, uh, of the uh, percentage of, of the number of infected neutrophils in that context, and that was very significant. However, if you look at macrophage or by itself, I mean, whereas there was an increase in the the number of cells, I mean, uh, sh as shown here, 
because the average was quite high, but uh, because maybe those two, but anyway, there was not significant, whereas there was a trend. And the same thing, it was a trend for the reduction of the uh, infected uh, uh, macrophage in the context of exosome plus leishmania, but it was being found not to be significant. And this was uh, for six to nine uh, different animals. So overall, what we can tell here is that clearly syndemics in one favor, I mean, that infection of uh, the uh, myelid cells that may cause that, uh, 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 that augmented skin inflammation and pathology because the infection is then greater. So then it will process, but then will cause that infection. And if we do repeat the experiment in vitro using a parental cavity macrophage from the wild type versus the knockout, we can see that in a time dependent manner, uh, clearly that uh, very rapidly after one hour, we see there's a significant increase of the number of uh, infected cells here in that context. Uh, uh, and, uh, and also a clear reduction of the number compared to in the knockout mice, which was very similar in each case for the one receiving Leishmania alone or Leishmania plus exosome. So there was, a, we mimic around the same thing as we observed, but if we let it go, the interaction that's still uh, going on, that difference here and also that difference in that level and so on. But the, here also what it shows of interest because we let it go longer, it seems that, I mean, even the Leishmania major may need somehow also a bit of an XN1 to better interact with the cells. Or this may reflect also the, what has been reported in literature that an XN1 sometimes have a defect in phagocytosis. So here in that context, I mean, of that uh, new part I show you today, I mean, uh, what we can conclude is that in fact, for sure compared to Bob Simai, the B6 mice doesn't seem to, uh, uh, I mean, progress in that, in the pathology due to a difference in the type of cytokine that are produced on that by the annex and one knockout, okay? Because they were showing similar ways of, uh, for the interferon gamma producing cells. However, we showed there was indication that annex and one, I mean, uh, may influence the infection of neutrophils and potentially macrophage, both in vitro and for sure in vitro with the macrophage, but it seemed that it's affecting the early moment of interaction. And in fact, we, are still now working on that issue of uh, to observe what's going on exactly. And, uh, but now it's not the time yet to release that information, but uh, we have uh, now identified also other partner involved in the, that uh, augmented uh, infection of the cells during the initial time. But now we'll jump at the final session. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, one thing, I mean, in the context of vesicles, I mean, that's something, I mean, that have been shown. So I start to talk about nanobiomes because in the gut of the sand fly, but also uh, because I have a project where we showed that there was virus in the gut of sand fly that can be also co-inoculated and be involved in the uh, augmentation of the skin, uh, the skin pathology. However, recently, but not more anymore, it was in 2010, 2011, I mean, the group of Fazel in Switzerland showed that there was some uh, Leishmania named Leishmania viania guyanensis that were normally naturally infected with an endovirus like LR for Leishmania, RNA virus one, which was very small, 50 nanometer in size, and was being shown to be in, involved to accelerate the mucocutaneous formation uh, of the leishmaniasis, mucocutaneous leishmaniasis formation, because it was increasing very strongly uh, several cytokine chemokines and uh, 2TLR3 to cause that because of the virus. But then in that paper, they didn't explain how the virus was interacting. They proposed that when the, some parasite, when they go inside, they must slice and then that interacting. But because of our background, when I wrote that uh, news and views, when I read and, and thought about it, I mean, I write the thing, I start to think that maybe it's because the parasite, I mean, can, I mean, have vesicles containing virus that was there. So, I mean, in order to show that, here we have an electron microscopy view of a, a Guyanensis at uh, 25 in culture. And here, when you put at 37, you see some little pimples appearing there, that's our vesicles. Uh, after we isolate, I mean, here, electron microscopy, uh, we, these one has been uh, also isolated uh, over sucrose gradient and we found in this, the specific fraction uh, uh, corresponding to uh, uh, where we have usually get Leishmania exosome uh, that to contain uh, HGSP83, they were positive uh, by Western, the GP63, as well as uh, the NTLRV1 we produce here that detect the virus only in the 
the parasite infected, I mean, with the virus, the name is LG21, and this is the exosome isolated from it, and so we see, I mean, the protein from uh, that uh, virus, whereas it's absent for the panamensis, which is also another Viania, okay? And you have the Mexicana that doesn't contain, and this one never, uh, it's a parasite that is not a Viania, so I will explain later, but anyway, it's a control. But uh, what's important here, that's it, we've been able to isolate vesicles that were containing all markers known to be related to Lishmar exosome or vesicles, small vesicles, and, uh, and that was the thing. So uh, and that's the work of uh, Vanessa again, uh, Alonso Lirafilo, and my ex-research uh, uh, assistant, uh, Caroline Martel, who was a great help in that very uh, long project. So here we have some electron microscopy from uh, isolated vesicles from the uh, Lechmaya Viana Guyanensis in culture. As you can see, I really like this photo. You can see the virus inside, okay? Here we have a free virus. You see, it's exactly the same thing. Is it there, free? But this once is surrounded by vesicles from the host, from which is the parasite. So here you have two, I mean, uh, with one parasite, one virus, sorry, and here you have empty vesicles. And then other example here, so come, did the way we open lipid from that one, and then we've been able to uh, counter stain and give a dark appearance of the virus. And that permit us, in fact, to contain the number of a virus who was present or not. And this is an example. So it was permitting to get the contrast, treating with some triton. And then we found out that the, from the parasite, the virus, the exosome release, released by the parasite, around 30% were containing virus. And uh, in order to find out what was, what was the plus for the virus to get such an uh, envelope, because as you remember maybe from the cartoon, it's an it's a RNA virus, non-envelope RNA virus. So if he's alone outside in response to, uh, I mean, RNAs of different type, he will be not able to see to uh, survive, I mean, to the, in fact, the RNA street because it's the type of RNAs that attack that, uh, that RNA of the virus. And you can see here it's completely zapped, I mean, both, uh, and then when you have the LG21 exosome, here you see that it's protecting against all the different RNAs that is given to the physical. But when you treat with Triton X, I mean, you see there, as, there was a very nice, I mean, uh, capacity of the RNA tree to cause inactivation of the virus. So uh, this is very exciting. So, I mean, the virus use that, I mean, uh, I mean, to become more capable if they go outside the cell. So we did very interesting because we showed that this virus is able to become enveloped because of the, he's going through exosomal pathway, you assume. And then with that envelope is able to survive the external milieu, but not only that, uh, but first going to the next step. Uh, here's only against, here, in fact, it's figure, I mean, the first part was vesicles isolated from culture. Here is uh, electron microscopy from parasite from culture, where we've been able to show here you have vesicles, I mean, empty one with a virus inside here, you, you, I'm sorry, the virus, and then you have uh, exosome virus inside and exosome, and then a free virus again here, it does the same thing in fact. And here you have the flagellar pocket, you can see different uh, type of vesicle containing or not virus, and uh, that's the same thing here, here you have a bunch of virus inside the pocket there. Uh, so it's just to show that in the promas you got, you see the similar thing and also virus inside the, the, the parasite. So that's it. So we test whether, I mean, it's possible for, because in evolution inside the sand fly before coming to human, this must have happened a long time ago. So, I mean, what was the plus for the parasite or for the virus in fact, and the virus, so he's able to survive outside. So he's gonna be able to survive outside of the parasite, but then is he able to interact with the uh, other Leishmania parasite? So what we did, we culture, uh, I mean, Leishmania uh, LG21 that uh, producing a GFP exosome. And we add those exosome or LRB1 free to parasite and culture of Panamensis or the Mexicana. Leishmania Panamensis is also a Viania group parasite. So they have an RNA pathway, okay? And then this way, and that's why, it has been shown they are able to keep the virus because if we take a Mexicana, people have tried in the past to transfect any other parasite that are not an RNA pathway and they weren't able to, uh, to survive there for a long time. But here I want to show in that experiment using the GFP expressing uh, exosome uh, is that, I mean, uh, the both on LPA or LMAX in this at for a 25 degree centigrade. When you give, I mean, those vesicles to parasite, you can see that very rapidly they are able to fuse 
to the, the promastigot, the parasite, and then to transfer or, I mean, to be, uh, I mean, uh, uh, interacting and then to become green for us because of the GFP that have been connected or internalized to them. So here it was to show there was fusion between those vesicles containing or not virus were able to happen in uh, with the promastigot. And in fact, the next step was to evaluate whether when in such condition do we have transfer of material from the virus. It was, was very interesting is that here's different condition we did, okay, that are shown here, one to six, okay. And where we use, I mean, uh, those insert, we put on the top the LG21 positive, uh, LRV1 positive uh, parasite. And then on the bottom, we put all the LPA, all the L Mexicana. And then we let it go for uh, two to three days, okay? And then we collected those parasites and, and then uh, did some extraction to look at the ORF uh, coding for LRV1. And what we found in the LMAX scanner that doesn't have RNA pathway is that after 48 hours of contact like this, I mean, the physical were able to pass point through the 0.22 micro, 0.45 mic, uh, micrometer, uh, I mean, uh, filter here, and then they were able then to interact because I mean, we've been able to detect the virus inside the Mexicana. But interestingly, after 96 hours, they were all gone. They were not able to maintain themselves inside the El Mexicana. But on the other hand, if you look at the Leishmania Viania Panamensis, that was very exciting too, because then we saw that all of them were very highly positive. But if you look after a week or two weeks after they have been kept in culture and we went up to four weeks, they were all still showing signal for our one saying that they were still infected with the, with the virus. So that mean, I mean, if we think about the evolutionary speaking, it seems that I mean virus, I mean, infecting eukaryotic cell because in Leishmania, after all, it's an eukaryotic cell. It has a nucleus, has our own cells. So, I mean, a long time ago, before even maybe multicellular organism was existing, virus evolved a way to hijack or use exomal pathway from their whole cells to be, got to be released outside and then be able to go and infect other non-infected pathogens. So that was very exciting at, the, at that point of view. And right now what we're doing in the lab, we are studying, I mean, using proteomic and also RNA-seq approach to see how, I mean, this infection with the virus influence, I mean, the Leishmania uh, functions, but also the, this changing something in the, in the profile of protein and also the gene expression of those libraries. So that's very exciting, because that permit to study, in fact, different ways host pathogen interaction, because now this time it's the Lashmiya, the host. So it's very exciting. So, I mean, we did with uh, my colleague, uh, Christopher Prada and his, and his uh, lovely wife, Aida, we, she did an incredible uh, uh, cartoon. And there we showed how the intra uh, Lashmania cycle, the larger one, that is at the end, we see that some are encapsulated, some are the virus can go out, but is not able to infect and this will cause infection. And then that's the outcomes that caused by those uh, positive infected one or not. But uh, now that changed the way to see this uh, overall uh, life cycle of the Lashmania uh, Vienna Guyanensis that are those virus. And then they can cause, I mean, uh, that interaction. But at the end, what we're very interested in is to find out what's happening in the food pad. Does those parasites at the LGT1 were becoming more infectious? So here we have a first figure. We inject the Bob C. This was not B6 mice, I remember. Uh, the thing we inject them with L Mexicana in green, with the Lishma Panamensis in black, and then the Lishma Guyanensis uh, 21, who's positive for a large one. As you can see, the Panamensis of Mexicana is known to give around a similar low uh, foot pad inflammation is quite clear. Whereas when they have a virus like the, the panamesis is very highly infectious and cause incredible uh, uh, lesion development as well as metastasis. But what was interesting is that if we isolate vesicles from the LG21, and to repeat what we shown in our the previous paper and comparing to LMEX or L panamesis, you can see that LMEX alone give, I mean, that infection that's over seven weeks. We show that if we co-inoculate the virus alone with the LMEX, not much happened. But if you co-inoculate the LMEX exosome, isolated from the, the parasitic culture with the LMEX, you have a nice increase of the foot pad swelling as we previously published. And if we use the LG21 with the virus 
of the LG21, we can see that it's a way more rapid. So really the vesicles, I mean, from the parasite uh, that contain LR1 is very important and do something important in that context. And because not only the LMX scanner that doesn't produce itself a virus and is not able to become infected, and that must happen early, but the panamensis who's becoming infected by the virus, I mean, when you do the same uh, scheme of, of uh, treatment, we can see again that the virus not doing much. I mean, the uh, LPA exosome is increasing the, the, uh, the swelling of the foot pad, but clearly the one with the virus from the LG21 was very strong to cause that uh, augmentation. And finally, that was the ultimate and last figures. Uh, what we were interested to see whether the Lishmaia panamensis have become infected with LRV1, whereas there's less parasite. A virus inside was still able, I mean, uh, to cause, I mean, the uh, augmented uh, infection of by Leishmania. And effectively, if you compare in the in black, you have the uh, Leishmania palamensis infection with the, the parasite, uh, non infected parasite, that's a typical one. The LG21, which has very high number of virus, and then you have the panamensis that become infected, and you can see very rapidly as well, it causes a significant increase in the footpath swelling of the animals that uh, were, I mean, infected with the panamensis that was then infected with the LRV1. So that's uh, clearly demonstrating that, I mean, uh, once that person become infected, he was also augmented his fitness or capacity to better infect and process uh, the infection. So what we can uh, conclude from uh, what I show you today is that for sure, we think about vector-borne diseases. I mean, the thing is that these vectors are not simply a syringe that inoculate a pathogen, but they will inoculate different things. And that's not only in this case, promascot, a metacyclic promascot, but also it will be able to inject, I mean, vesicles, not now recognized exosome from Leishmania to be involved in the modulation of the infection during the initial moment. We have so the mucus, the PSG I mentioned, and also we have no flubovirus. So, I mean, the microbiome or the nanobiome of the, uh, of the gut of the sandfly is very important to cause this thing. And vesicles such as exome has very important role to play in the infectious process and in pathology. And finally, I would like to thank the main people who was involved in there is the Vanessa Ataid, who's no more in the lab, who did all that beautiful work. There was also, uh, I mean, Caroline Martel, who also left the lab, I mean, uh, a few months ago uh, to go to another city because uh, family uh, uh, reason. And then also you have the work from Alonso Basile Valdira Filo that was, uh, did a great job. I mean, uh, the work with the Annexin one, and uh, here a view of the gang. You have some collaborators, Shannon Kamawi and Chirreco Picello, and Fernando Alvarez for the project, and also collaborating with a lot with Christopher Fernandez Prada that was not involved in those studies, but uh, we are doing great work together. Here, I just want uh, to show the, where we are. That's the Miguel University Health Center. Here we have the hospital by itself, and here you have the research center that we are on 450 scientists there with their team working there. So voila, so thank you very much. And uh, I'm, uh, if there's still time for question, uh, I can uh, answer some here. Thanks, thanks Martin. There are five minutes or so for questions. Um, there are some questions already. Um, I think I can start. I have, a, I have a curiosity on one of the first uh, images that you showed where you showed the uh, GP63 uh, immunofluorescence staining, and I was wondering if that localizes with the endosome markers, and in particular with the recycling endosome markers. That's a very good question. I know at that time, you see, I'm not the cell biologist of uh, endosome by itself, and at the time when I saw that, it's more something we observe, and then we decide to go uh, study at that level, see what's happening, because that's very rapid. It's within one hours. This was a parasite named Leishmania Mexicana. It's very powerful and we observe these things. But I know that the work from other scientists, they show for sure, I mean, the once the parasite is inside the phagosome, okay, mm -hmm. it be, I mean, there's thing can be released, but Neil Reiner in his work, where you look at the mastigot inside the phagosome of Leishmania infected macrophage, there was not much vesicles released. You saw just a little dot, but for sure, mm -hmm. if you look at what to isolate vesicle from a Leishmania infected, uh, uh, Leishmania infected uh, cells, you will find bicycle, but doesn't mean coming from the parasite. In fact, we did a paper where we collected vesicular risk by macrophage and just multiple Leishmania infection. And when we did the proteomic, we only find GP63 to be from Leishmania and those vesicles from macrophage. 
So the all the rest stay inside. But I mean, during that initial moment, I cannot tell what it is. There's a thing I, I will have to put a student to look at specifically in that context, but it was, uh, I cannot tell really, because it's very rapid. Okay. Okay. The, the, I have some other questions, but there is also something from Carolina. Um, yeah. And then other questions are coming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm um, just wondering, uh, Martin, because um, there are, well, in other studies, it's reported that uh, extracellular vesicles is going across blood brain barrier or in the cancer study, uh, preparing pre-metastatic niche. I was just wondering whether you look also onto different type of cells, like the effect of the EVs itself on the epithelial cells in relation of this infection. Yeah, good point. The thing is that, I mean, uh, I focus mainly on myeloid cells because as if you look at the infection by leishmania, the main cell that become infected are, I mean, the macrophage DCs and the neutrophils at the beginning infect some thymus on lesion, but otherwise other cells, Sometimes you can find fibroblasts late in the infection, but the majority of cells between that all those are the one. But the thing I'm sure if vesicles uh, are released, I mean, more in the context uh, of visual maniasis, maybe, because uh, the thing we have to realize that when you have a cutaneous infection, it's mm -hmm. only the lymph nodes surrounding the lesion that become, I mean, uh, where the parasite can go, and that means that where interaction can uh, happen. But also even there, as I mentioned to uh, Dolores, is that it's not clear whether uh, a mass of leishmania, which are not dividing too fast, release so much vesicle that we go out and do things. So in our case, we more believe that it's really during the initial moment when there's inoculation, there's something happening. And for sure at that moment, maybe vesicles coming from the same fly may interact with, I mean, other cell type there. That's something to uh, evaluate, yeah, to explore. Okay. I, okay, I do have another question about the annexin A1 work. That sounds very interesting, but I was, uh, I, I, I got confused um, as to whether this annexin A1 is coming from the vesicles, from the parasite or from the macrophage. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, it's coming from the macrophage. I see, so that's why the um, knockdown in the host. Um, that were exactly it. Yeah, because we look for annexin one in the parasite, there's no annexin one, and uh, that's was a control. But the thing for sure, it's coming from the macrophage and neutrophils, they are will produce it. And then these one, in fact, I mean, the, then what we observe, we try, we're gonna do some electron, some, I mean, more super resolution microscope to see, if we're able to see interaction with the annexin one and the thing. But, uh, but in between, we find another sensor that is involved in that trio. So you have the exosomal leishmania, the annexin one, which is released, and then you have another one there. So, but that, that I mean, uh, this one, I still have some stuff to do in the, before writing the paper. So that's why I'm not talking about it, but it's all of them are necessary for sure to do the better infection. That's very interesting. Okay. If there are no other questions, I'll, I'll uh, thank you, uh, Martin, again, for uh, sharing your data with us today, and I'll pass it to Carolina for closing. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Martin. It's a lovely presentation. It's a lot of things to learn. And I think it's very exciting that you show the EVs encapsulate the viral particle. And uh, I think it's the first time that I actually see a very clear uh, electron. No, no, that's, that's the point. I mean, that. uh, sometimes I don't like to say that, but in fact, even our sand fly work is the first clear demonstration mm. that uh, cells release in vivo, so clear, in vivo vesicles and formation of MVB and things like that. And also the other one is the first clear demonstration that the virus can become, I mean, other people publish like we've been scooped because we took, want to go to in depth in nature paper where they show some human virus are also encapsulated or I know people report that sometimes also you have RNA portion, you have piece of virus, but to have one fully encapsulate and then doing something, that's a very uh, nice stuff, that's why. Uh, yeah, so, and I was just, I wonder, with, yeah, I wonder whether that EVs help the uptake of the viral particle as well. Maybe there's a rate of, you know, the kinetics, like maybe it's faster or whatnot. I think that would be really exciting to look at. Yeah, you know, there's many things to do and push there. Mm. We are doing a lot of things in the lab related to that. 
And uh, yeah. And one thing I forgot to mention, I mean, I think I want to thank as well, or just realized I didn't put, I see her there. I mean, uh, I mean, Marisa Rami was very highly involved in the Nature Micro paper. She did all, but I didn't show everything because there's a lot of data that paper is crazy, but we show also impact on the transactional mechanisms of the leishmania due to the virus and things like that. So that's very nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thanks so much, Martin. <laughs>